good morning uh, friends and uh, thanks a lot manish and the organizing team for having me here today uh, the first approach in managing any small people situation is to achieve a maximum pharmacological midriasis in certain situations uh, the pupil size is still small or sub optimal and we need to think about alternate strategies to have a larger pupil to make the subsequent cataract surgery safer for the patient as well as for the surgeon now uh, when i peruse the the program booklets and i see topics like faco in unmodified small pupil faco sans ovd faco faco sans bss so i, I feel it is just faco sans consigns so whenever you have a pupil which is uh, less than 3 to 4 mm or in certain situations when even it is little larger but has associated uh, comorbidities for example <clears throat> a shallow anterior chamber a unhealthy cornea a very hard cataract you know we must resort to a small pupil strategy and uh, there are a plethora of uh, possibilities plethora of devices available for us and personally these are the devices which are there in my armamentarium but what i'm going to talk to you today is uh, to have a strategy so that we can reduce the dependence on these devices because a device after all is an additional intervention and that can always have associated complications it has a learning curve and it is expensive so i'm going to discuss with you certain pearls or certain things that i i always use in my practice and use this so that i, I uh, avoid using devices in most of my cases and only in the, in the as a last resort when nothing else works i'll be using a device so it is important for us to know what what are the exact etiology of the small pupil from 2004 onwards and you know, after the ifis uh, was it was described was published by by campbell and david chang you know so it has become a very important uh, piece of history so i always try to find out am i did dealing with an ifis candidate or is it a traditional uh, uh, etiology of small pupil that i'm dealing with and we uh, we have a system where the nurses uh, run through all the you know all the medications that that can give rise to myosis and then and 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 in and ifis and those those patients are segregated and we have a separate strategy pupil fatigue is something which you need to avoid because you know if you are using cyclopentolate the day before uh, uh, the surgery uh, it it has been shown that it it reduces uh, the pupillary dilatation by a factor of 0.73 mm from uh, the situation when you have used tropic amide one percent so if you have uh, a pupil uh, if you want to dilate to six millimeter and then you get a 0.73 mm millimeter less dilatation because i've used the cyclopentolate the day before and it has resulted in pupillary fatigue your pupillary area is going to be reduced by 23 percent so if if at all you have to dilate the pupil for your uh, work up either the fundus work up or whatever you know use tropicamide one percent and then uh, another thing is, uh, you know, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we'd like to pick up the IFIS candidates. So in the literature, there has been uh, uh, there has been a discussion that a pupil size not dilating, maximum midriasis, less than 6.5 or 7 millimeters or 8 millimeters, you need to be very careful about uh, you know, the, those patients because they may have intraoperative meiosis. And actually, uh, there was uh, now when you so these measurements are cumbersome. You have to take an anterior segment picture, and then you have to you may have to use a caliper uh, uh, preoperatively and to find out what exactly the proportions. So this particular paper uh, has uh, described the intuitive uh, uh, the PL ratio, pupil to limbal uh, diameter ratio. So you just look at the pupils, uh, the patients, dilated pupil, and then if it is less than sixty percent by intuition, you feel it less than sixty percent, then you can you can think about uh, the patient uh, developing IFIS in the uh, in the intraoperative uh, period. So many a time I get pupils like that on the surgical table, and the nurses say that doctor, this patient is allergic to tropic acid plus, so we have used only homide or the cyclopentolate. But what I tell my staff is. You know, on the day of the surgery, it is still possible for us to use tropic acid plus drops. So this is what was the maximum dilatation with uh, with only tropic amide, without the plus, without the phenylephrine component. And when I added it, I got an ad adequate size pupil and if safe emulsification was done. This is the post-op picture. This is the day one picture. Because you know we are going to put uh, topical steroids immediately after the surgery and on the first day about six times a day. 
so the allergy factor really doesn't uh, uh, come come into the consideration in the, and the, in the bargain you get a well dilated pupil and you can avoid pupillary devices and perform a safe surgery so uh, we use adrenaline in the infusion fluid and one uh, you know the half an ampoule of one in 1000 preservative free adrenaline some surgeons have used intracamerally in ifs patients though i'm not a big fan of any intracameral use Recently, we had a, a product launch of, uh, of called Phenocan Plus from a company, Indian company. Actually, this is already available in the, in the Western market, a, a product called Midrain, which are the same, some, same components. So this actually uh, was looked into uh, and was published in a JCRS article in March 2018. And it showed that uh, no, there is maximum pupillary dilatation within 30 seconds. And the midrain is stable, the pupil doesn't come down. And you don't require really any additional pupillary dilatation devices or any additional doses intraoperatively. And the important thing is, you know, that when the, they compare the decrease in the pupillary size more than three millimeters, in the topical group, it was seen in 20%, 20 patients. Whereas in this particular group where uh, midbrain was used, it was in only in one patient. Now, among all the devices, I am a big fan of uh, the, these iris hooks for various reasons and uh, these are disposable devices very simple to use you just need a 27 gauge needle to to manipulate the these iris hooks in, into the patient's eye and uh, so uh, though i have you know why 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 you prefer the iris retractors over the other ring expanders you know you can use it even uveitic people when there's booster sinicia people have become ectopic uh, it can give selective dilatation for example when i'm doing a vitrectomy and there is re the reverse pupillary block uh, the lens side is diaphragm retropartion syndrome. So I can just use an iris hook just to gently lift up the iris from the anterior lens capsule. So the, the tremendous depending of the anterior chamber, which otherwise may happen, does not occur. It can be safely used in FA kick and vitrectomy eyes. If we use ring devices in these cases where the people post, post vitrectomy, some of the high myopic patients, when the pupil comes down and be, becomes large, the ring devices may dislocate and it may go into the posterior chamber. So it may be difficult, additional manual for you to retrieve it and reapply it or take it out, whatever. And these devices, the iris hooks can also be used once, uh, you know, the, after the capsulotomy has been done. I'll just show you a video when there is intraoperative myosis and you feel that, you know, you're not able to manage the nucleus or the cortex adequately without a larger pupillary dilatation. And then in certain situations, like when you have not expected uh, a significant zonulopathy or whenever there's a zonular dialysis, you can use the same iris hook, though if you, you a capsular hook is preferable, but in this kind of situation, you can definitely use an iris hook to stabilize the capsular bag. For example, then uh, this, uh, these hooks can also be used to stabilize the, the, the ring, the capsular tension segment, which has got this eyelet. You can pass it through the eyelets and stabilize. So you don't have to suture the capsular tension device intraoperatively. At the end of the surgery, it can be done. So, because let us see this video. Now, this was a intumescent cataract and a very shallow anterior chamber. And I started off surgery. There's a viscomidriasis. People dilated extremely well. And this patient developed eye face uh, intraoperatively. You'll see here people becoming small, surgery becoming difficult. So, I decided to use an iris hook uh, in between, uh, I mean, intraoperatively. So, one, caution, one precaution here is when you apply the iris hook. And the same thing also holds true for any ring device you make sure that the hook does not hook the capsular axis margin. In this particular case, I had a rexis tear, which went to the periphery. So you inject OVD between the iris and the anterior capsule, create a, a, a very friendly zone, and ensure that the iris hook only hooks around the pupillary margin, and it doesn't take the rexis margin. So this is an important uh, 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 tip to, man to keep in your mind when you operate on these patients. It has potential problems, and of course, any, any device, anything will have potential problems if you don't handle it carefully. My other non-hook devices that I really enjoy using is the Malugin Ring uh, uh, version 2, uh, which can go in through a very small incision, and it gives rise to 6.25 or 7 millimeter people. It has a very thin profile. BH uh, device, BHEX by Suvan Bhattacharya is again one of my favorite devices. It has a very low vertical profile. I have used iris expanders from Beaver as well as from the OSCs. They're pretty good. And there has been a study. These are some of the devices. Gupta Ring has just come into the market. I've used only trial. I've not been very, very comfortable using these devices. So which device is superior? Now, this particular study in JCRS, it compared the Malugin ring with the Visitec I ring. And the results were very interesting. It showed that, you know, the, with the 
malugin ring, the pupillary cosmetic effect postoperatively was worse compared to the Visitec eye ring. And uh, this is again, you know, a comparison between whether you should iris hooks or malugin ring or phenylephrine. This is the largest study published in eye uh, recently, I think from the uh, Moorfields group. And the results were again, very interesting. It showed that the malugin ring had maximum incidence of iris uh, sphincter tear compared to iris hooks or by intracameral uh, myotics. And uh, the other complications are, seem to be little more, you know, atonic pupil, corneal edema, sister macular edema, DM tear was more in the malugin ring group. So this group, they, they, their take home message was, you know, though the complications were not high with any of these, but with malugin ring, somehow uh, the complication rate was higher. So friends, uh, whenever we have, I'm dealing with an IFIS uh, pupil, make sure that, you know, you follow the general surgical principles so if wound is properly constructed, hydro dissection is done most in, in a slower manner, in a gentle manner, lower all irrigation aspiration parameters, have an appropriate OVT strategy. And if it is really a very small pupil to start with, you don't hesitate in using a mechanical expansion device. So in conclusion, you need to know what exactly is the etiology classification. Is it an IFIS candidate that you're dealing with? Pharmacological, pharmacologic modulation is extremely important. Use a sphincter sparing non-device option to start with because postoperatively cosmesis will be much better, particularly if you're using a uh, advanced technology intracural lens. And a device use should is has to be considered when a patient has significant comorbidities, a heart cataract, a shallow anterior chamber, questionable zonular status, and if the pupil is very small. Thank you so much for your kind attention.